I love a good uh, interview, like a really good interview with somebody who has been in a significant uh, period of time or, or something very significant of a moment in history. And um, I was looking this week just to see, like, what are the most viewed interviews of all time? Because I think it's so significant when you consider that something happened and then you get to hear from the people that were involved and you get to connect with the backstory of all of the different things that were, uh, that was going on at that time. So I started to look and uh, different things came up. The most viewed interview of all time on television was Oprah's uh, interview with Michael Jackson. 140 million people watched that. It was, it was quite a while ago, but he hadn't spoken in like 14 years and all of those things were going on. And 140 million people watched that. It was interesting to look further down that list and see like after Richard Nixon's um, impeachment, there was a, an interview with him. 75 million people watched that. That's so interesting. The New York Times did a whole story about all of the things that happened September 11th with all of the people that were around President Bush at that time. It was phenomenally interesting to hear about those interviews, to what people were doing, what they were thinking in that particular moment, to hear the backstory of what was happening at such a significant point in history. Well, today I feel like our passage is that same kind of place. See, David, who we, we, we know is such a significant, significant character in all of Scripture, David has been at the zenith of Israel. He has been king, and so many things are happening. But we're also aware of his failures as a person. We remember that one of the worst moments in David's life was when he acted out in such a way, made such a poor choice of taking of his, one of his best friend's wives and then having that best friend killed and doing his best to cover it all completely up. Like you think of all of David's successes and then you come in contact with this incredible failure of him as a person. We know that big story. We know that's a significant part of, his, uh, his, of, of what's written about him in the Bible. But I want us today to look a little bit closer, a little bit deeper, because this passage today gives us backstory. It helps us to understand what's going on in this man's life and this huge, very poor choice, moral failure of his, and what is happening. See, I think it's so important for us to see it today, because I think this communicates to every man, woman, and child that's here today, not because you've done something like David did, but because all of us struggle with the, the, the guilt and the shame that comes from decisions, things that have happened to us as people. And I want us to dig today into this passage. We're not going to look at any other scripture. We're going to stay right here in Psalm 32. And I want us to see this backstory, this, this, uh, this opportunity to see David telling us exactly what's happening in his life, like what he felt, what he did, and really how he came out of this. It's such a beautiful passage of scripture because it starts off talking about something so difficult and yet it starts off with the word blessed. Another way you could translate that is happy. All right, look at verse one with me if you will. It says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins have been covered. All right, blessed is the person or happy is the person who these sins, these transgressions are covered. These things are forgiven. And I want to really connect with you today on those two very, very important words. What it means to be forgiven. What it means when our sins are covered. And to see today a little bit more about confession and repentance in each one of our lives. We oftentimes, when you hear the word repent or confession, it'll conjure up lots of different thoughts. Sometimes those thoughts are very, very negative. But today from David's story, I want you to really see the joy that is in confession and repentance. How confession and repentance aren't just something you do occasionally, but it's an opportunity to live out of confession and repentance and to know the real freedom that comes from being forgiven. David's life is a great example to us 
a great reminder to us of God's love, but you get to see a person who's so open and honest with his life. I mean, it's recorded right there for us. And if you really do a, a reading of all of the things that happened to David, you learn about his family, you learn about his wife, you learn about all of these different things, but there's a very deep, deep emotional connection to this person. You see him talking to God in the beauty of a relationship that's been formed over a significant amount of time. He talks to God and you see why God calls him a man after his own heart. Because David was so, uh, I would say, personable. He was so people-oriented. This was a guy who we learned so much about, and I think we can take a lot from his story today. But as you think about what happened, what David went through during that particular point in his life, that time of such failure in his life, I really want us to see about this process of forgiveness, like what he did and how he reacted and it led to a lot of negative things. I want you to look today at the struggle of hiding. It's in verse 3 and verse 4. This is David writing. He says this. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. That idea of the heat of summer I think fits for our moment right now, right? We catch a little bit of that you see what's happening here to him. You see the physical and the emotional toll of the guilt that was in his life. It was, talks about his bones were, were literally creaking. Like he was under so much stress, so much difficulty during this time that it physically had a toll on him. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that. If there's, there's been a reaction or there's been a choice you made in your life where in, almost instantly it's like you're wringing your hands and you're, you're clutching your head and like, why did I do that? And it starts to plague you as a person as guilt and shame add up. And you start to really can get a, a burden that physically and emotionally impacts you because of something. That's what's happening to David here. He feels it so deeply in his core that it's literally impacted his physical body, his emotional self are impacted by these choices. Now you might ask, well, how long did this go on? And most scholars and most commentators believe this could have been about a year that David went through this. That David's choice during this time where he had so little communication with God, where the guilt and shame piled up on him as a person, lasted for a long time. I want to look at three S's today of of this period of David's life, of how he lived. The first thing is this, that David lived in silence. It tells us right here, it says in verse 3, when I kept silent. David had had this incredible relationship with God, but all of a sudden, this relationship is silent. And it's not because God had cut him off. It was because the shame and guilt that David carried made him or brought him to a place where he decided he wasn't going to have communication with God. And how often does that happen? When you know you did something wrong, when you know you're struggling, and instead of going to the one that, that can really do something about it, instead of really putting your, your heart and, and emptying yourself to God, we retract, we hide, and we stay to ourselves. And this was happening to David during this time. And I imagine for someone who was so people-oriented, who had such a great relationship with God, this must have been absolutely horrible. And in a way, David's abandoning God. God's not abandoning David, but David has pulled himself back, and he's hidden, and it's vexing to him as a person. The second is this. David lived during this period of time a life in secret. See, this happens when sin permeates and, and gets deep into our lives is you start to live in a secret way. You might throw on that mask of everything is fine and, and, uh, and, and, and everything's coming together, but you start to live sort of a double life and things are kept in secret. And David lives this way. When you look at this whole portion of scripture and you see how David was living, he wasn't connected to people in any way. Everything was a secret. Like the people that knew about it, Bathsheba and maybe some of the other people, 
We don't have any record that he's connecting with anybody. But David starts to live his life in secret. He can understand to some degree with the guilt over what he had done, the shame. What would people think of him? What would people say about him? Would people want to hunt him down over what he had done? But he starts to live life in secret. And I would encourage you with this, and I encourage myself with it as well. When we act outside without any accountability, when we don't have friendships and relationships where people can say those important challenges that each one of us needs, or, or we don't have a place where we can be open with someone else, we've set ourselves up for some type of failure. It's when those kinds of times happen that relationships can start that are not, that God never intended for us. It's those times when we're most susceptible. And David lived this point of his life in secret. The third thing I see in David's struggle while he was hiding is that he lived a life of sorrow. You look at those couple of verses right there. You see the emotional and the physical toll but David was out of relationship with other people. He's also out of relationship with God. I mean, he's living a very difficult and sad point in his life where he is outside of relationship. And you see the sorrow. You can almost feel it as you read those verses. And you connect a little bit with what it must have been like during this time. And I don't know if you think for just a moment about a point in your life where there's something an incident, a point of failure, where you found yourself in a similar set of circumstances, where you felt the sadness and the sorrow. Because of your so stubbornness, you've, you felt that you were living a completely secret part of your life, and you lived in silence to God and to others. And we see that David is living this way. And you look at this, and as we think of David telling us the backstory to what had happened, he was a guy who had experienced so many good things, and now it's such a period of darkness inside of his life. But I want us to see it didn't stay like this. There's something interesting that happens with David, where after a period of time, I believe that you see it, especially in verse 4, where it says this. It says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. See, God's hand didn't crush David at this moment. God's hand didn't smite him or, or wipe him off of the face of the earth. And we could probably understand if God had done that. What David had done was abhorrent. But God's hand was heavy on him. His hand of love for David was pushing David in such a way that David's life may have felt darker and darker and darker and, and he felt more separated and, and had a silence in his life. But God was disciplining David out of his love for him. He was pushing him. He was putting pressure on him. The pressure of God's love on David's life to bring him back. I wonder if God doesn't do that for us. If God doesn't put that pressure on us as people. Because sometimes it's that pressure where we feel the angst and the struggle within our hearts that says something's not right. I need to get this fixed with God. See, this happens and it shows how much God loved David. Even though David's strength was sapped like heat in the summer, even though David's life was heading in so many ways that were negative, God was working in his heart to bring him back. I want us to see today in our, my third point, which is the anatomy of forgiveness. The anatomy or, or, or the way of forgiveness that David goes through during this time as he tells us what happened to him. This is what happened to him as a person as he went through a point of confession, of repentance, and he experienced the beauty, the beauty of God's forgiveness in his life. If you look with me for just a second at verse 5, I want you to look and see what this says. It says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I love this part right here, because here is David being honest 
Here is David being transparent, and he's finally doing something about what has happened. And I look at this, and there's several things that come out to me. If we look at what repentance and confession actually is, I see first that it's an acknowledgement. David acknowledges his sin. It's an honest, honest um, statement about what has happened. And you look here in Psalm 32 or you look in Psalm 51 and you see how this plays out in David's life where, where he is finally honest about what's happened. Because when you live a life in secret, when you live a life in silence without accountability, and when you live a life of sorrow, you're not in a place of being honest. And David finally gets honest with God. And he says what happens. Now the beauty of this is God already knew everything. David, but he gave David an opportunity to really be honest. For David to acknowledge what was going on, what had happened in his life, and where it had taken him. So he finally acknowledges it. And the second thing I want us to see is, is the moment of confession. Where he didn't blame it on other people. He didn't say, God, you did all of these things and, and I was left with no choice but to do this. But he was really honest about what he had done and he confesses his sin. Because it's one thing to acknowledge it, but I think confession goes even further. Confession is the point where someone is saying, not only this is what I did, but I want a relationship back with you. And I see that in the confession moment. Because David talks to God like he hadn't done in so long. But other times in David's life, we see him communicating with God. And he's doing it here. And he's getting really honest about what happened. And that he needs that relationship with God. So you read through Psalms. You read through David's story. And you see time and time again where David just talks to God. Where they're connected. Where it's almost like this beautiful relationship of David walking with God, someone he had known his whole life. There's this beauty of intimacy that happens there. And you see it start back here in these couple of verses of him just being honest, of him just reconnecting, of him desiring that relationship and the freedom of forgiveness. You see David reaching out. But I also want us to see repentance takes place in David's life. He acknowledges his sin, he confesses his sin, and I believe he really repents. And repentance is this. Repentance is agreeing with God on what he sees sin as. It's being in agreement with God over what has been done. Because what David had done to his friend was horrific. God hated that. It was absolutely everything God never designed to happen for David. He didn't want that at all. And David is coming to a place of honesty with God. He's coming to a place of agreeing with what God what says about sin. He's not just agreeing with him, but he's also turning away from what was going on. He was actually turning away from that, that thing, that, that, that struggle, that failure that he had, that heart attitude that had left him so stubborn for all of those, those months, all of that period of time away from God. He's getting honest in this moment, and he's repenting. We read on in this little passage, the short passage, a short psalm, and we see almost a joy coming off of David's lips. Even though he's repenting, even though he's confessing, there's joy because he's looking back at that time of forgiveness, and he sees the relationship, how it came back. I love this so much because it's actually written as a song. This psalm is written as a song. It would have been sung. But you see inside of here, there's four words that, that aren't in your program today, but they're Hebrew words that are there. And what happens is there would be pauses, and the word is sila. There would be pauses as one would be singing this. But you know where there's no sila? There's no sila. There's no pause in verse 5. If you look back at verse 5, this is what it says. It says, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Get this. There's no pause here. 
There's no time between David asking for forgiveness and God granting him that forgiveness. And I think if there's something that you walk away with today that is good news, is that when we confess, when we repent of our struggle, our failures, our sin, God hears it and he forgives us. Like he cares that much about us as people that when we repent and we seek his face, he's not far from us. We have forgiveness in him. I'd like to read a quote to you from uh, a guy named Edward Welch. This is what he says about God's forgiveness. He says, our father is simply inclined to forgive. This distinguishes him from all invented gods and from all humanity. He is eager to forgive at the slightest hint that we acknowledge our sin and our guilt. It comes from Jeremiah 3.3. 3. See, God is there. God is willing. God loves you and me so much that we have forgiveness when we ask. See, God knew David's heart. And God knew the brokenness of that man's life. And God knows the heart and brokenness of each one of us. And he is there in the most beautiful act of love because he's the one that brought us out. He's the one that redeemed us. He's the one that's there to give forgiveness, to re restore the relationship. And remember this, the relationship wasn't, wasn't broken and fractured because of what God had done. God didn't do that to David. But David's choices were what brought about that fracture. But because of repentance, because of confession, because of God's working and God's grace, David was forgiven. I look at that and I'm so thankful. Like none of us have really done the things that David has done. But how many times have we looked at things that we know that God never would want us to look at? Or we've gossiped and we've hurt people behind their backs so easily. How many times have those kinds of things happened in each one of our lives? And I think this passage helps us to see is that we need to call out on the name of God. We need to repent and confess and acknowledge what has happened. We need to do these things. And God, in the beautiful freedom of, the, of his grace, allows that to happen. I think of it as such a beautiful picture. And there is no doubt that the freedom that is found in God's forgiveness is what takes, in this passage, takes away a lot of David's struggle. Because that guilt and shame had, had, had loaded up. And if you think of that beautiful book, Pilgrim's Progress, where this man Christian is, is so vexed with all of the choices and, and his own sin, and he carries along with him this massive load on his back that weights him down and, and pushes his face into the ground. And there's a point in that book where he sees and knows the beautiful salvation through Jesus Christ, and that load comes off of his back. And the freedom that is there is so beautifully written about and you kind of think for a moment, it's like the relief of being forgiven. I connect a lot with that relief of being forgiven. When I told this story before, and it's just such a, a, a special story for me as a person, but I had made a terrible decision. My dad had told me when I was a teenager not to use his car. And his car was much cooler than my yellow Datsun Nissan pickup truck. It was, it was like my friends made fun of it and called it the corn cob. My parents had gone out of town and said, don't, my dad said, don't use my car. Some things are, you know, I just, you know, and I kind of ignored it. And I knew I wasn't supposed to use it. I made a choice and I took it. But one of the things I didn't realize was that car had been completely drained of oil. And I learned this, you can actually drive a little ways like that. But it doesn't, you don't go for very far. It was one of the worst moments because I knew, I knew I had done something that in essence gave my dad every reason to break a relationship. Every reason. I had specifically been told not. All of these, it was just massive weight on my shoulders. I remember going back uh, to the house and uh, trying to find a backpack and like see if I could pack up some things and you know it was kind of like time for me to head out on my own, you know, this was it. But I remember when my dad got home and I, he knew it whole thing came out and I remember the moment I just I was such a sickening time my dad came to me and he said 
first thing he said was, I love you so much. And this whole process worked out where I felt the incredible relief of my dad's forgiveness in that moment. I go back to that story because to me that embodies like what Christ has done for us. That in his, that in God's love, he forgave us. He forgave us. And that's something not to, not to wallow in pity or, or to, to rub our faces in the ground, but rather to say, this is amazing. This is, this is the beauty of forgiveness, is that there's incredible freedom and relief. I experienced that relief in an earthly sense with my father that day. And I still look back and, and, uh, and, and my dad says, you know, you remember it a little better than I do. I was so upset. And, but you know what? I connected so deeply that day with forgiveness. And when you think about it, when you think about a holy God loves us so much that he would do the work on the cross of giving his life, of taking the sin upon him, that the punishment that we deserve in order to rescue because he loved us so much. And what he does, I think, is he calls us through this passage and so many others to not lie that we're broken people, not lie that we have, that, that, that our lives can be very dark and nasty, but have the freedom to seek out through repentance and, 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 and ask for his forgiveness. See, I think God uses David's life and this just, a, a, this atrocity of his decision that, that created so many victims to show us, like, I can forgive anything I want, and I will forgive whatever I want. And it gives me hope, and I think I want to translate and give that to you as well, is that that hope that God forgives, that he can forgive anything. And there's a desire on his part for all of us to have a life that is full of confession, a place of repentance and honesty with him, because he cares about each one of us. You see it work out in David's life. And I want you to see the last point today is a relationship that, of God that's forged out of sacrifice. It's a relationship that gets forged out of sacrifice. And look as David gives us again this backstory of what was going on in his life at this time. Look what it says in verses 7 and 10. It says, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. You see what happens to David? God's reaction is beautiful. It's one of unfailing love. It's one of protection. You see grace all over this. And I think of something the beautiful sort of play on words that happens. Where at the very beginning, what is David doing? A life in secret. He's hiding from God. He's hiding from others. But at the end of this, end of this psalm, all of a sudden there's another word hiding. Because part of what David's confession is, and part of it's really knowing God's forgiveness is, he's found himself hiding in God. The safe place this place of, of comfort, this place of security, even in spite of what had happened, David finds himself in the beauty of God's provision and safety. So I look at this today, and I just want to encourage each one of you to take a little bit of time today, just in confession. Take a little bit of time in repentance. Take a little bit of time with your maker, the one, uh, your redeemer. And today we're going to come to the table in just a few moments. And I hope that you sense a little bit of this meal being God's way of communicating with you very specifically about how much he loves and cares, how much grace, unmerited favor has been extended to you as a person, as a believer. Because you take of it and you're reminded of Christ giving his life for you. I mean, that's the most beautiful act of love that you could ever imagine. And you think about it, it's not just to save us, but it's to have a relationship with us. And I see the freedom of forgiveness, the opportunity to confess, to not be uh, hammered, not to be thrown out, not to have our faces rubbed in it, but a way that relationship can happen with God. Today as you come to this, 
I hope you consider for just a moment a little bit about God's grace, how much he cares for you. Let's pray. Dear Father, you love us so much. You care about us so deeply. Father, I pray that you just give us a little bit of time in this room this morning of reflection. Give us a little bit of time to just go to you with confession. Lord, bring to our minds and our hearts those points of of places we need to repent. Father, you've been so good to us. And Father, we ask today that you would just do a special work. Lord, I pray if there's someone in here who has lost their way, that feels like the darkness of their choices and decisions is more than they can ever bear, Lord, help them to know the beauty of forgiveness today. Lord, I pray that you would make us people and that you would be, as as you build us as the potter, we're clay in your hands. And Lord, thank you for what you're doing. You're making something beautiful. Lord, thank you for the way that you've loved and you've cared for us. And we ask all these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen.